I'm not an idiot. You know, I, I've read a couple of books and I've been to a pretty good school. And, and I'd like to think that your respect for me would be enough to know that this man doesn't seem like a dodo. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. This is Radio Free Mormon on the air, broadcasting behind enemy lines. Tonight's episode could have a number of titles. It could be called Make Way for Dodos or Send in the Dodos or What Would Jesus Dodo? Tonight is August 1st, 2017 and just a little over 24 hours ago. The LDS Church-owned newspaper Deseret News issued a retraction by Elder Jeffrey Holland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles of a story that he told a month ago to mission presidents at the MTC. It was published a month ago in the Deseret News. And yesterday, just a little over a month later, it was retracted. The story is an exciting story. It's a very faith-promoting story. It's a miracle story involving missionaries. Now, you cannot find the original version of this story anymore at the Deseret News because they have scrubbed the original story and replaced the original story with the retraction that ran yesterday. However, some forward-thinking people saved the original story, so I can read it to you now. This is as good a place as any to begin this podcast. First off, we have to note that Elder Holland's words are quoted in the story, but the story is written by a reporter for the Deseret News named Scott Lloyd. So you'll find that there are some places where what he says is synopsized by the reporter. Here's how it goes under the title, The Missionary Speech of All Time. Elder Holland closed by relating a story, being careful to protect the privacy and anonymity of the participants. Now, I've got to stop right there and say, my spider sense goes off whenever I hear a faith-promoting story where we don't get the names of the people who are involved. There's a reason for it here, to protect the privacy and anonymity of the participants. But when you read the story, one wonders, why is it that these participants would want their anonymity preserved? In fact, they're probably local legends in the Warden Stake where they live in Idaho. And later on, in the retraction, we'll find further reason to question why it is that the anonymity or the privacy of these participants is being so scrupulously observed by Elder Holland. Is it just to protect their privacy, or is it to cover his tracks? At any rate, the story goes on. The story of a young man from southern Idaho. One night, the young man stormed out of the house and set off to join an infamous motorcycle gang. He succeeded in that resolve. By the way, this is very common, you must understand, for young men to storm out of the house with the goal in mind of joining an infamous motorcycle gang. We'll find out later that this is supposed to be the Hell's Angels motorcycle gang. He succeeded in that resolve and for 20 years became immersed in a culture of temptations yielded to and degradations explored, never contacting his parents who feared that he was dead. By the way, this will be interesting too, that his parents feared that he was dead because in other accounts, which we will explore ourselves later, it appears that his parents knew where he lived sufficiently to contact local leaders and try and have the local leaders where this wayward boy lived contact him. Something that parents normally wouldn't do if they thought their child was dead. Going on with the story, eventually ending up in Southern California, he one day was sitting on the porch of a rented home when he saw two LDS missionaries making their way up the street. Now, whether the home is rented or the home is not rented is immaterial to the story, but every now and again, it's nice to throw in a detail like that to give your story verisimilitude. With a rush of memory and guilt, regret and rage, he despised the very sight of them, Elder Holland recounted. But he was safe because he kept all visitors at bay by employing two Doberman pinchers who viciously charged the gate every moment that anyone came near. 
Of course, it's important to have two Doberman Pinschers so that you can be safe from Mormon missionaries. Mormon missionaries cause more crime than any other group in the United States, including Hell's Angels, apparently. You cannot be too careful around them. I added that to the story. Going on with the news article. The dogs startled the missionaries as they passed by and continued on. Our man on the porch, laughing at the lovely little drama he had just witnessed, wishing only that the gate hadn't restrained his two dogs. Then the two elders stopped, looked at each other, conversed a little, likely said a silent prayer, then turned around and approached the gate. The Dobermans, on cue, charged the gate again, hit it, snarling, frothing, and then stopped in their tracks, Elder Holland said. They looked at the missionaries, dropped their heads, ambled back to the front steps, and lay down. Here's where the miracles start coming fast and furious, as furious as two Dobermans charging a couple of Mormon missionaries, one might say. The man on the porch was speechless as the missionaries opened the gate, walked up the path, and greeted him. One of the elders said, Are you from this part of California? The man said, No. If you want to know, I'm from Pocatello, Idaho, because suddenly this very antagonistic Hell's Angel biker dude is conversational with the missionaries. It's probably the hoodoo they did on his Doberman pinchers that got him talking. There was a pause. That's interesting, the elder said. Do you know the such and such family in Pocatello? Elder Holland put such and such there to preserve their privacy and anonymity, no doubt. Do you know the such and such family in Pocatello? With a stunned look, our biker paused and then, in very measured words, said, Yeah, I know them. They are my parents. I read it that way because Elder Holland tells us it was in very measured words. Well, they're my parents too, the missionary said. God has sent me to invite you to come home. The younger brother had been born after the older boy had left home. The elder brother did not even know of him. Mom and Dad have been praying for you every morning and night for 20 years, the younger brother said. It was 20 years ago on a night just like tonight. Okay, I added that part too. The younger brother continues in the story. They were not sure you were alive. But they knew, if you were, that someday you would come back to us. The wayward son invited the two in, and they talked for the rest of the day and some of the night. He did return home, returned to church activity, and in March 2015, remember that date, by the way, it will become important later, and in March 2015 was married and sealed in the Boise, Idaho Temple. Commenting on the account, Elder Holland said, This is a story of the role of Almighty God, the Savior of the world, and the Holy Ghost involved in the work of the ministry to which we've been called. Now, unfortunately, a month later, he's going to issue a retraction saying that none of the story ever happened. The Holy Ghost prompted those parents to keep praying, to keep believing, to keep trusting, the Holy Ghost inspired that rebellious boy to come to himself like the prodigal he was and to head for California. The Holy Ghost influenced that younger son to serve a mission and be willing to accept a call to Southern California because that takes a lot of faith to accept a call to Southern California. The Holy Ghost inspired one of my brethren in the Twelve who was on the assignment desk that day to trust his impression and assign that young man for service not a great distance from his native-born state. Um, you see, the whole thing is is that a month later, Elder Holland's going to say that none of the miraculous stuff in this story ever happened. And in fact, the younger brother was not on his mission at the time that the older brother came back. So this is starting to get embarrassing for me as I read it. But I have to go on. In the name of journalistic integrity. The Holy Ghost inspired that mission president to assign that young missionary to that district and that member unit, which is what GAs call wards or branches, that member unit. The Holy Ghost led those missionaries to that street that day, that hour, 
with Big Brother sitting on the porch waiting, and with Doberman pinchers notwithstanding, the Holy Ghost prompted those elders to stop, talk, and in spite of their fear, to go back and present their message. Now, the Holy Ghost was doing a lot of things in the story that Elder Holland told the mission presidents back in June of this year. The Holy Ghost was apparently so busy doing all those other things that he didn't have time to tell Elder Holland that this story was a bunch of malarkey. Going on with Elder Holland. And through the elders, the Holy Ghost taught repentance and brought true conversion to one coming back into the fold. Elder Holland said the young elder, without realizing it, gave the missionary speech of all time when he said to his brother, God has sent me here to invite you to come home. And once again, the problem is, is that a month later, Elder Holland will say that the missionary speech of all time was never actually given. For purposes of comparison now, here is yesterday's retraction by Elder Holland published in the very same Deseret News, yesterday being July 31st, 2017. Here is the retraction by Elder Holland. Dateline, Salt Lake City. A story of spiritual rescue that gained broad attention after it was shared with Mormon mission presidents last month is inaccurate, and the LDS leader who presented it withdrew it on Monday. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints shared the story of a missionary rescue during the Mission President Seminar on June 27th at the Missionary Training Center in Provo, ironically on the date of Joseph Smith's assassination. I added the part about Joseph Smith. The church-owned church news published the story, which spread through social media and other links, and has now been read and retold thousands of times. I will add here that the general reaction to this story one month ago was pretty much divided into two camps. There were those who heard it and thought it sounded like a bunch of hogwash in the first place, and then there were those who believed it was absolutely 100% God's own truth, because after all, it was being told by an apostle of Jesus Christ. Elder Holland withdrew it Monday and said in a statement that he had learned from the family that the story contained inaccuracies. Now, this is an interesting thing. Elder Holland is telling this story far and wide to mission presidents, and we'll find he's been telling it in other locations as well. A fantastic, miraculous missionary story, but at no point did Elder Holland apparently think it important to talk to the participants. There are two people in this story who know whether it happened, three if you count, the younger brother's missionary companion. But it's the younger missionary, and it's the biker who ended up coming back to the church. Elder Holland doesn't talk to them. Elder Holland doesn't even talk to any member of the family. Instead, after he's been telling the story, and it's been broadcast far and wide in the church news, he has to say in his retraction, Elder Holland withdrew it Monday and said in a statement that he had learned from the family that the story contained inaccuracies. Well, that's a nice way of saying that every single miraculous part of the story is an out-and-out -out lie. People who had heard the story from the family members had told it to church leaders. That's going to be an important sentence, too, because as we will see, we can trace this story back to Elder Kim B. Clark of the Seventy, from whom Elder Holland almost certainly co-opted it. People who had heard the story from family members had told it to church leaders. The story was that a man who had been estranged from his Idaho family for 20 years was found by a brother he didn't know he had while his brother was serving a mission in California. The story of rescue was complete when the estranged brother returned to both his family and the church. Notice how the recap of the story mentions none of the miraculous elements. Elder Holland issued the following statement Monday. So here's the actual statement from Elder Holland. Quote, A few weeks ago, when speaking to new mission presidents at the Missionary Training Center, I shared a story about two brothers, just as I heard it from individuals who knew the family and had heard it recounted by a family member. So Elder Holland admits to sharing a miraculous story that he did not fact-check 
He did not get from the people involved. He didn't even get it from a member of the family. Instead, he got it from somebody who had heard it from a member of the family. Within a few days, my office was contacted by the family, who expressed concern that some elements of that account, which means all the miraculous elements of the account, who expressed concern that some elements of that account were not accurate due to embellishing by a family member. One thing I want to point out here is that Elder Holland admits that within a few days of his sharing this story, he was contacted by the family. He shared the story on June 27, 2017, within a few days would have been by the end of June, and here it is, the end of July, July 31st, that he finally gets around to issuing his retraction. Why so long, Elder Holland? Why did it take you a month after being contacted by family members to tell you the story was bunk? Why did it take so long for you to issue your retraction? And what has been going on in your office during that month? What have you been up to? Elder Holland's statement continues. There are inspiring and important missionary lessons in this story. So here's the part where he focuses on the bare bones of the story, which is true, which is not miraculous, in order to try and downplay the fact that he's telling a miraculous story with no miracle in it. These are inspiring and important missionary lessons in this story. The older brother did indeed leave his home and his family, and for many years pursued the lifestyle I described in my talk. During these years, his parents lovingly tried to maintain contact, prayed faithfully for him, and even sent local leaders to seek after him. See, there's the part about local leaders. How do you send local leaders to seek after your child if you don't have an idea as to where your child is? However, at the time, his younger brother was called to serve as a missionary. This is important. However, at the time, his younger brother was called to serve as a missionary. The older brother had already returned to Idaho. So when his brother is called to serve as a missionary, the older brother isn't in Southern California anymore if he ever was there in the first place. He's somewhere out of town pursuing this lifestyle. But by the time the younger brother is called to serve on the mission, the older brother has already gone back to Idaho. There is no meeting between the two. There is no conversation between the two. There is no miraculous meeting in which the younger brother finds out that the older brother is his brother and the older brother finds out that the younger brother is his brother. It never happened. So it goes without saying that none of the other miraculous elements happened. There were no Doberman pinchers. They didn't lie down. They didn't go to sleep. There was none of this other stuff that made the story miraculous in the first place. There was none of this other stuff that made the story worth telling to mission presidents in the first place. Once again, however, at the time his younger brother was called to serve as a missionary, the older brother had already returned to Idaho. With the help of missionaries there, he started the difficult and courageous process of changing his life. In time, he would return to full activity and be sealed in the temple, and he would also have a son who would serve a mission. So really, the only thing that happens in this story that's left is that there's a member of the church who falls away from the church and then later comes back to the church and his younger brother at some point does go on a mission. That's all that's left of the story. There is nothing left that is miraculous. Elder Holland goes on to say how it was that this happened, that he's issuing this retraction. Quote, As a courtesy to me, the family contacted my office. Boy, I would have liked to have overheard that telephone conversation. As a courtesy to me, the family contacted my office. Well, somebody maybe in the family contacted his office. I doubt the entire family was on the other end of the line. This is another way of making it anonymous, of making it difficult, if not impossible, to track down what the true facts are in this story. As a courtesy to me, the family contacted my office, wanting me to be aware of the inaccurate parts of the story and offering their help in avoiding any perpetuation of those elements in the account I heard. I am deeply touched by their humility and courage in doing so. Yeah, you're not kidding about that, Elder Holland. How much courage does it take to contact a general authority and tell them all that great stuff you were spouting about the miracles that were involved with this member of our family? None of it's true. 
I am deeply touched by their humility and courage in doing so, and as an equal courtesy to them, I am withdrawing the story completely and request that it not be shared further. So basically everybody's being courteous here. They were courteous in calling him and he's being courteous back to him. That's the end of Elder Holland's statement, but the story, the retraction story continues because they get in some, <laughs> they get in some hired experts in order to give their opinions about how great it is that Elder Holland is doing this. An ethicist and a historian said using stories is important, but fraught. Period. It doesn't say fraught with what. I'm guessing it's fraught with danger, fraught with peril, fraught with Maybe you should check your sources before you start telling these stories, Elder Holland. But the sentence is, an ethicist and a historian said using stories is important, but fraught. One of the reasons you fact-check stories, even from people you love or trust or admire, is that there are a lot of ways to get things wrong, said Kelly McBride, a media ethicist at the Pointer Institute. That's an interesting statement from the ethicist. One of the reasons you fact-check stories, even from people you love or trust or admire, is that there are a lot of ways to get things wrong. Well, I'm not sure exactly who that comment is directed to, but one might think that Scott Lloyd, the reporter who ran the original story, might take some advice from this. Because certainly he loves trust and admires Elder Holland, but he sure didn't fact-check the story. And Elder Holland, for his part, did not fact-check the story. It's not like Elder Holland is so busy he can't fact check a freaking story. He's got a staff of people who can fact check stories. He's got people he can call to go call this family and have the family get in contact with him. It is not difficult for him to fact check the story, but for one reason or another, Elder Holland did not do that. He went off half cocked. And something happened in the past month to where he decided he needed to distance himself from this story and to distance himself from it fast. Now, the spin in this Deseret News article is that he is distancing himself from it because he's doing the right thing. He's being courteous. He said it thinking it was true. He found out it wasn't true. He wants to set the record straight. All that is good, noble, virtuous, kind, trustworthy, brave, clean, reverent on the part of Elder Holland. But we have to note the fact that this is the first time that I have ever heard of an apostle or general authority of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints ever issuing a retraction on a story that they have told. And there are times when Elder Holland or others could and should have issued retractions on stories they have told. It wasn't that many years ago that Elder Holland famously stood up in general conference with a copy of the Book of Mormon and proclaimed to the audience of millions, if you include those watching by satellite, that this was the very Book of Mormon that Joseph Smith was read to by Hiram Smith in Carthage Jail the very day that Joseph Smith and Hiram were assassinated. And once again, I can't help noticing that this talk was given by Elder Holland to the mission presidents on June 27th of 2017, on the anniversary of that date. A little irony goes a long way. Going back to the news article, the ethicist says one of the reasons you fact-check stories, Elder Holland, even from people you love or trust or admire, or that you haven't even talked to, really, Elder Holland, is that there are a lot of ways to get things wrong. It is important to differentiate between someone who knowingly embellished a story and someone who retold a story the way it was received, said Keith Erickson, who is obviously a hack who's being hired by the church to provide cover for Elder Holland. Because now he's trying to say Elder Holland didn't knowingly embellish a story. No, that's the unnamed member of the family who's being thrown under the bus because Elder Holland didn't do what any reasonable person would have done, which was to fact-check his story before telling it to a bunch of mission presidents. All the more should he have fact-checked it because it was miraculous. It was incredible. It was too good to be true. And it turned out that, yes, it was too good to be true. Going back to the article, it is important to differentiate between someone who knowingly embellished a story, the family member, and someone who retold a story the way it was received, Elder Holland, said Keith Erickson, who left his job as a history professor and assistant president of the University of Texas at El Paso to become, what? Oh, 
director of the LDS Church History Library three years ago, so he's totally in the tank. In Elder Holland's case, he retold the story as it was given, he said. Keith Erickson has no freaking idea what Elder Holland is saying. He has no idea if Elder Holland is retelling the story as it was given. All he is doing is serving as cover for Elder Holland. Going back to the media ethicist, Kelly McBride, for another quote, McBride said Elder Holland had an obligation to set the record straight. Well, damn right, McBride. Elder Holland had an obligation to set the record straight. That much is true. He also had a similar obligation for the story about the Book of Mormon, which was not the same Book of Mormon which was in Carthage jail with Joseph Smith and Hiram Smith on June 27, 1844. I'm not sure I made that point clearly enough before. Subsequent research by others showed it was a different Book of Mormon, and actually the Book of Mormon Elder Holland claimed he was holding was not that Book of Mormon. That Book of Mormon was somewhere else residing safely in a museum at the time Elder Holland was holding up a different Book of Mormon. But Elder Holland has not set the record straight on that, even though McBride says Elder Holland has an obligation to set the record straight. If he had not done so, she said, it would have had the potential to harm his relationship with his audience. On the other hand, stepping forward with the correction can improve that relationship. Now, I think that's probably true. It would have had the potential to harm his relationship with his audience. But it has to be understood that that potential exists only if the story gets out. In other words, if the story gets out that this is a false story that Elder Holland is telling. And that can only happen from the family, apparently. Apparently, they were willing to go public. Or maybe Elder Holland just felt that, unlike the Book of Mormon story that he told in general conference, on this one he should set the record straight, just because it's the right thing to do. For the most part, it actually deepens trust, McBride said. For some reason, it's not having that effect on me. For the most part, it actually deepens trust, McBride said, and it creates a level of transparency and humility. McBride said media organizations build trust when they issue corrections, and of course, most of the media organizations issue their corrections on the back page of the newspaper to issue the correction on the front page story that came out the week before. That's how media organizations build trust. She said the church news had an obligation to do so, but did not blame it for not verifying the story. Oh, come on now. McBride's a hack for the church, too. She said the church news had an obligation to do so. Well, that's true but did not blame it for not verifying the story? That's absolutely crazy, because we just got done quoting her, the same Kelly McBride, earlier in the same story, is saying one of the reasons you fact-check stories is that there are a lot of ways to get things wrong. Now she's saying the church news had an obligation to issue a correction, but did not blame it for not verifying the story. You can see how much she's in the tank, too. She's contradicted herself right there. I don't know that they have, because... They are not a watchdog organization. No, the, the Church News is not a watchdog organization for the apostles, but they are supposed to fact check their stories. I don't know that they have because they are not a watchdog organization. Any independent responsibility to fact check any of the church leaders. But I think that if they repeat something that's wrong, they certainly have an obligation to let their audience know how they did that, why they did that, and what the accurate information is, McBride said. So she's gone from saying that one of the reasons you fact-check stories, even from people you love or trust or admire, is that there are a lot of ways to get things wrong, to saying that as far as the church news goes, they don't have any independent responsibility to fact-check any of the church leaders. The church news took the story down on Monday. Anyone who follows a link to the story previously disseminated on social media will find it replaced by a short explanation in Elder Holland's statement. Yes, Elder Holland had it taken down because he didn't want it to continue to be disseminated. However, he also may have had it taken down so that there was no more liability for having told the story, and hopefully it could go down the memory hole as in 1984. Stories have been embellished. This is the article. Stories have been embellished since people began telling them, Erickson said. Some LDS church members have embellished stories of faith since the church's beginning. I can't believe they let this Erickson person actually say that and have it quoted in the church news. Some LDS members have embellished stories of faith since the church's beginning. Well, who could that take into account? Is that church leaders? Is that Joseph Smith? Is that other members who have told miraculous stories? 
Oh, no. Erickson gives an example to try and diminish the damage of that statement. For example, some early Mormons exaggerated their personal connections to Joseph Smith. Yes, and some early Mormons claimed that they saw Brigham Young transfigured into Joseph Smith when they weren't even in town at the time of the event. Going on with a quote from Mr. Erickson, typically any story is incomplete and different tellings of the story become contradictory, he said. Now, why is he saying that? What we're going to find out is that a lot of these versions of the story, because there are multiple versions of this story, and it appears that many of them are contradictory, somewhat like Joseph Smith's first vision. Why is Erickson saying that if he doesn't already know that there are different versions out there of this story that are contradictory? Here's what he says. It looks like a preemptive strike. Typically, any story is incomplete, and different tellings of the story become contradictory, he said. The past is gone. We have just pieces of it in the form of stories. Whenever we encounter a piece of the past, we always have to ask, what is this piece? Who did it come from? How do I make sense of it today? Well, in this podcast, we're going to try and answer some of those questions about this story. Who did it come from? How do I make sense of it today? We will follow Mr. Erickson's advice. He goes on. This particular experience has a twist that makes it even more difficult, Erickson said. One of the most common recommendations is to go to the source of the stories, not just accept hearsay or second-party retellings. Well, thank you for that. Mr. Erickson, this appears to be something that you and Ms. McBride have in common. It's important to fact-check stories. Erickson says one of the most common recommendations is to go to the source of the stories, not just accept hearsay or second-party retellings. Elder Holland, he doesn't add the Elder Holland part. But who else would he be talking about? Now, Elder Holland, as we know, has gone to a couple of pretty good schools. He's read a few books, and he's certainly not a dodo. So why is it that Elder Holland doesn't know that one of the most common recommendations is to go to the source of the stories and not just accept hearsay or second-party retellings. This time, Erickson says, there is a twist that a participant in the story was involved in the embellishing or changing the story. That, frankly, makes it more difficult, unquote, hold the press there for a second. Because here's the thing. Erickson here is saying more than Elder Holland is admitting. Is Erickson getting it wrong, or does Erickson know more than Elder Oaks is willing to confess? He says this time there is a twist that a participant in the story, Elder Holland has never said it was a participant in the story who embellished it. All he said is that a family member embellished it. But this time, Erickson says there is a twist that a participant in the story, this is one of the brothers, it's one of the two brothers Erickson is saying, this time, there is a twist that a participant in the story was involved in the embellishing or changing the story. That, frankly, makes it more difficult. That's the end of Erickson's quote. Now, once again, this makes sense that it makes it more difficult. But really, does it? Why don't you just talk to the other participant in the story, the younger brother? And I'm tipping my hand there a bit because I think it's clear that it is the older brother, the biker brother in the story, who's been embellishing and changing the story. And I'll get to that here presently as to why I think that is. Finishing off this article, the church has plenty of authentic missionary stories. In fact, the church history library collects and records them, Erickson said. But I guess none of the authentic missionary stories are good enough or miraculous enough to be told publicly by apostles to mission presidents. Finally, Erickson has the last word in this article. Maybe this is an opportunity to invite people to tell their stories so we have more of them on the record. End quote. Nice diversionary tactic, Mr. Erickson. So that's the end of the retraction. And what we have to do now is we have to start trying to figure out where this story came from originally. Because even though this latest telling of the story to the mission presidents, because it was published in the Deseret News, gained wide circulation. This isn't the first time that Elder Holland has told this story. In fact, last year in 2016, he told the same story to a group of mission presidents, and apparently this was in Texas. From the Texas Houston South Mission, a blog titled President's Pin, dated April 25, 2016, Teachings from Elder Holland. 
This appears to have been written by President Hall of the Texas Houston South Mission. In his blog for that day, he writes, Elders and sisters, this past week, Sister Hall and I were blessed to attend a mission president seminar with our area presidency, along with 20 other mission presidents and their wives in the Southwest area. Just a few days before the seminar, we learned that the meeting would be presided over by Elder Jeffrey R. Holland, and it did not disappoint Smiley Face. Think of the seminar as a zone conference for mission presidents, where we come to receive instruction, counsel with one another, and leave uplifted and energized to continue this great work. Elder Holland spent both days with us and instructed us throughout the day. So cool. I testify that he is called of God, a living prophet and apostle, who loves missionaries and missionary work, and telling miraculous stories that never really happened. Okay, I did add that last part. In our many discussions at the seminar, Elder Holland shared an account not too dissimilar from that of the prodigal son we read about in Luke 15. He told of a man that was born and raised in southern Idaho who had grown up in the church and had all the blessings of the gospel laid before him. In his late teens, he decided he wanted his inheritance, of which there was none, jumped on his motorcycle and moved to the Big Apple to find a more thrilling and better life. Does this story sound familiar? It will more so as we go on. Never to think of family and home again, he was done with what he was taught to be true. Upon arriving in New York City, he began to sow a lifestyle of immorality, drug abuse, tattoos, and worldliness beyond reproach. While not necessarily happy, he supposed it was better than anything better he could be doing, so he sank deeper and deeper into a pit. One morning he woke up and decided he'd had enough of New York and that he'd make a new start on the sunny beaches of Southern California. He rode his motorcycle on the long journey and intentionally drove as far away as he could from his small town in Idaho. So apparently he went from New York to Southern California via Mexico. Along the way, he hooked up with a new motorcycle gang and upon arriving in California, continued the party lifestyle, added more tattoos, and distanced himself further and further from who he had once been. A few years went by, and he made his home in a shabby part of town, guarded by his two Rottweilers. W wait a second, I thought they were Doberman Pinschers. Well, in this version, they're Rottweilers. Now, the point of the story is to make it two aggressive, fierce, dangerous dogs. So, I don't know if it's Elder Holland who substituted Rottweilers for Doberman Pinschers when he was talking to the mission presidents in Texas last year, or whether it's this mission president who just got the name of the dog wrong, it's impossible to say. I just note the difference. For the record, guarded by his two Rottweilers, up to no good, one day a pair of Mormon missionaries were walking past his house, and as trained, the two vicious dogs leapt from the front porch and raced toward the sidewalk, only being held back by long chains around their neck and a fence that surrounded the yard. The dogs came barking with teeth bearing, saliva flying, and eager to keep all away. As wise missionaries... They, of course, avoided this particular house. No need to risk life and limb on trying to get into this door as they walked down the street some 30 yards down the road now. Oh, now we're getting the distance down the road. This is amazing. This almost sounds like the distance that Elder Holland told in his story about going down the wrong road. But distance is important because, once again, like whether a house is rendered or not, it shows verisimilitude. Some 30 yards down the road now, the senior companion looked at the junior and said, we have to go back to that house. So now we know the conversation between the two of them. The junior companion, thinking his senior companion was absolutely insane, reluctantly followed his companion back towards certain death. As they approached the fence, the Rottweiler sprang from the porch to see what was the matter. No, as they approached the fence, the Rottweiler sprang from the porch and went into their usual attack mode. This time, however, instead of trying to break the chains that held them back, they came to the fence's edge, turned around, and went back and sat on the porch. Seeing the dogs retreat, the emboldened elders passed through the gate, walked up to the porch, and knocked on the front door. The now heavily tattooed, twenty years older and worn down by life man opened the door and stared down the two missionaries. Well, I'm sorry, I thought that he was sitting on the porch enjoying the show. At least that's the way he was when Elder Holland told the story to the mission presidents earlier this year. Last year he's talking to mission presidents 
and now he comes out of the house. He's not on the porch at all. Unfazed by the image of the man in front of them, the elders began with a message they had come prepared to share, and before they could get much out, he asked them where they were from. So now it's the guy who's not on the porch but inside the house who asks the elders where the elders are from instead of the elders asking where he's from. What was it that that retraction said about that there can be a lot of contradictions when stories get retold? The junior companion said he was from a town in Utah, and the senior companion said he was from a small town in southern Idaho. This is amazing. Now we know where the junior companion is from. I suppose the odds are he's going to be from a town in Utah, but really, this kind of detail would not have been in the original story. It's being added for effect. The senior companion said he was from a small town in southern Idaho. That's the point. Surprised that this Idaho missionary was from the same part of the world he was from, he asked the missionary the name of the town. Once again, it is the guy who's not on the porch. It's the biker guy who comes to the door who's asking all the questions instead of Elder Holland's talk from a month ago in which it's the missionary who's asking all the questions. He asked the missionary the name of the town and was even more surprised to hear they were from the same town! Exclamation point! Now interested... The man asked if the missionary knew about such and such a man from this small town. Once again, we've got such and such a man. Now interested, the man asked if the missionary knew about such and such a man from this small town. The missionary responded that he did know him. The man then said, that is my father. And then the elder smiled and said, he is my father too. It's like John Jacob Jingleheimer Schmidt. His father is my father too. Elder Holland then went on to tell us that he's kept track of this man. Now, this is significant. Elder Holland then went on to tell us that he's kept track of this man. Okay, how does Elder Holland tell them that he's kept track of this man when in his retraction he says he never talked to the man in the first place? He never even talked to any member of this man's family. He heard it third hand. But according to the mission president from last year, 2016, Elder Holland then went on to tell us that he's kept track of this man. He's now returned to southern Idaho, tattoos and all, married and soon to be sealed in the temple. Okay, this is another point of contradiction. According to this mission president, Elder Holland said that the biker guy is soon to be sealed in the temple. This is written when? April 25th, 2016. If the biker guy is soon to be sealed in the temple, that would mean that he's going to be sealed in the temple, I don't know, I guess, sometime after this was written on April 25th, 2016. And yet, what was it that Elder Holland said in the original story? And by original story, I mean the story he told the mission presidents at the MTC in June of 2017, a month ago. What he said in the original story was this, quote, The wayward son invited the two in, and they talked for the rest of the day and some of the night. He did return home, returned to church activity, and... In March 2015, was married and sealed in the Boise, Idaho temple. This timeline is off. Elder Holland a month ago says that he was sealed in March of 2015, but last year, April 25th of 2016, the sealing is still in the future. How can that be? Now, it could be that the mission president just got it wrong, and basically on every point where he's trying to quote Elder Holland and give an accurate recounting of the story Elder Holland told, that on every point he's getting it confused and contradicting Elder Holland's story. However, it is also possible that Elder Holland has trouble keeping his story straight when he tells it for different audiences. Once again, I have to go to this retraction. Why is it that they quote Mr. Erickson is saying typically any story is incomplete and different tellings of the story become contradictory. Is that a preemptive strike? Because he knows that contradictory versions of this story exist and are out there. His point in telling us this story was to remind us as mission presidents that God not only knows his children, but he continues to watch over them. He stated, Imagine what the transfer board in heaven must look like and what it must have taken to get this young elder at this time in his life, to a place where he could rescue his brother. Imagine the prayers that came from his parents, who for years had never given up hope. Imagine the inspiration that must have come to a mission president 
who knew where to assign a missionary to this particular area. We've heard this trope before. Elder Holland's getting into the same finale of this story, where he talks about, imagine how over time the Holy Ghost was working to bring all these pieces together on this chessboard in order for this amazing, miraculous thing to happen. Imagine the inspiration that must have come to a mission president who knew where to assign a missionary to this particular area. Imagine what had to occur for the spirit to prompt the senior companion to heed a prompting and return to an undesirable task. As only Elder Holland can tenderly teach us, it's because God loves each and every one of us, and we should never forget it. Once again, this is an alternate version of the same story that Elder Holland told last month and which was retracted in all of its miraculous elements yesterday, July 31st, 2017. Now, I've mentioned Elder Kim B. Clark of the Quorum of the Seventy as a likely source for this story, or at least the source from which Elder Holland heard it. Remember that in his retraction, he states, I shared a story about two brothers just as I heard it from individuals who knew the family and had heard it recounted by a family member. Well, as it turns out, Elder Kim B. Clark of the Quorum of the Seventy fits that description. And also, as it turns out, Elder Kim B. Clark is on record as telling this story back in 2015. That's right, before Elder Holland shows up in April of 2016 telling this story, and again in 2017 telling this story, Elder Kim B. Clark was telling the same story back in 2015, in November of 2015, to be precise. And in each of these two accounts, as they are recorded by missionaries who were present to hear him, he claims to have had personal knowledge of this story because he was told it by the older brother, the wayward brother, after he returned to Idaho, where he learned it directly from his lips. The first blog entry that relates to this is from a sister Skinner who was serving in Toronto, Canada, apparently, who records having heard this story from Elder Clark on November 23, 2015. In her blog, she states this, Tuesday started out fantastically. So many things to do and a devotional to look forward to that night. I was very excited. Tuesday, we got the privilege to hear from Kim B. Clark of the 70. And he gave a wonderful talk about what makes a successful missionary. She states, and then he ended with a powerful story about a boy from Idaho who in his teens decided to run away from home and join a motorcycle gang. Yes, this is Elder Clark telling this story. He was with the Hells Angels. So now the Hells Angels gets thrown into the mix. He was with the Hells Angels for nearly 20 years before he woke up one day in New York and realized that he had no idea on how he had gotten there. Drove all the way to California to one of the safe houses where he tried to sober himself out. While sitting on the front porch of this house, he saw two missionaries walk by. He just sneered at them when they started towards his gate, which was guarded by two attacked dogs. Well, at least he's on the porch in this version and not inside the house. However, to his immense surprise, just as the elders opened the gate, the two killer dogs simply went to the base of their chains and fell asleep. Too surprised to say anything, he watched as the missionaries came up to him on the porch. One of them smiled and nodded at him while the other asked where he was from. Looking at them warily, he responded with his hometown in Idaho. The elder paused and then asked if he knew two names. He nodded once and then responded, They're my parents. The missionary blinked, nodded once, and then said, Once again, it's not important whether he blinks and nods once. These are extraneous details provided to give the story believability. The missionary blinked, nodded once, and then said, They're my parents, too. While this revelation blew the man away, the elder then had the state of mind to continue, God has sent me here to invite you home. See, there's the punchline. It's the same here in Elder Clark's story as it was in the account by Elder Holland last month. And he did. He went home. He cleaned up. He got to know his brother. He never knew he had. The end of the story is that just about a year ago, he was sealed in the temple to his wife. So once again, we have an issue with the timing of the sealing. This is given in November of 2015. It was just about a year ago, according to Elder Clark, that he was sealed, which would have been around November of 2014. Once again, this is different from what Elder Holland said a month ago, where he said they were sealed in March of 2015, and it still cannot be reconciled with Elder Holland's account to the mission presidents in April of 2016 that it was yet to come. It was going to be happening soon. So November of 2014 would be before 
April of 2016, and therefore there is a conflict there as well. It's hard to keep track of these temple ceilings. However, if Elder Holland or Elder Clark would just provide a name, it could be easily verified as to when and if this man was sealed in the Boise, Idaho temple. This story is told because of the miraculous nature of it. It is told for effect, and it has the desired effect. This missionary writes, This was a powerful story for me, one about love and about how God shows his love. There are no lost causes. We are all of infinite worth to God, and he will put us exactly where he needs us to be. I don't know who's out there that needs me right now, but there is someone who needs my exact words. While it's probably not going to be a long-lost brother or prodigal son, there is a brother or sister in Christ who needs me to invite them home. But that last missionary was not the only missionary to blog about hearing the story from Elder Kim Clark. Hermana Allison Knight, on her blog, also gave an account of it. In her blog dated Thursday, November nineteenth, two 2015, she writes, Before I go, I want to tell an amazing story we were told at the devotional last night by Kim B. Clark of the 70. So this being written on November 19th, 2015, apparently the devotional was given on Wednesday, November 18th, 2015. Before I go, I want to tell an amazing story we were told at the devotional last night by Kim B. Clark of the 70. He said, There was this man who grew up in Idaho Falls, in a faithful Mormon family. Now we have, by the way, the name of the town here, Idaho Falls, in a faithful Mormon family who ran away from home when he was 14 and went down a dark path of life. We also have his age when he ran away. He joined the Hell's Angels and got heavily into drugs and alcohol. One day he was passed out in the front yard of the home. So now he's passed out in the front yard of the home. The Hell's Angels have in L.A., California. This is a well-known tourist attraction, the home that the Hells Angels have in L.A., California. A place to dry out if you are too wasted to drive, she adds parenthetically, because, of course, Hells Angels are very concerned about not driving while under the influence. So, I'm sorry, once again, getting back to the sister's account. One day, he was passed out in the front yard of the home the Hells Angels have in L.A., California, a place to dry out if you are too wasted to drive, and some Mormon missionaries came walking up their street. He started mocking them because he used to be Mormon and thought these elders were so naive. So apparently at the point he started mocking them, he was no longer passed out in the front yard. They had two dogs. Wait a second. She also says he started mocking them because he used to be Mormon and thought these elders were so naive. Well, apparently the elders were not the only naive ones. The ones who were naive were Elder Holland who thought this story was true, Elder Clark, who thought this story was true, and every single person who heard this story from Elder Clark or Elder Holland who thought this story was true. Those are the people who were also naive. Going back to the story, he started mocking them because he used to be Mormon and thought these elders were so naive. They had two dogs in the yard that were trained to attack and kill anyone who tried to come into the yard, so he wasn't too worried about them trying to preach to him when they walked by while he was passed out. But then, when they got to the end of the street, they talked for a minute and turned around and came back to the Hell's Angel's house. Hey man, didn't anybody ever tell you that this was the clubhouse of the Satan's helpers? The dog started growling and acting like they were going to attack. But as soon as the elders stepped foot on their sidewalk, the dogs walked away and laid down and went to sleep. It's like a scene out of the first Harry Potter movie. I think the dog's name was Fluffy and it had three heads and had something to do with a harp. Then one of the elders came up to the wasted man from Idaho and said, What's up? <laughs> I'm so sorry, because this is what elders apparently say when they approach a Hell's Angel guy at their clubhouse in L.A., California. What's up? The man said, Oh, nothing. And then the elder asked, Where are you from? And he said, Idaho Falls. Then the elder said, No way! Me too! Do you happen to know the so-and-sos? Once again, dying to get the name of this family, but it's not going to be provided. Anonymity and privacy must be paramount. Do you happen to know the so-and-sos? And then the wasted man said, Yeah, they're my parents. Then the elder said something that changed both of their lives. They're my parents too. 
It was the Hell's Angel's younger brother, all grown up and called to serve a mission in California. The elder said to his older brother he never knew what happened to him, but that he knows that God sent him there to bring him home. He ended up helping his brother turn his life around, go back to church, find Jesus again, who apparently can be found only in the LDS church, move back home to Idaho and reconnect with her parents. He ended up getting married in the temple five years later. Wait, wait, hold it, hold it. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Uh, there are a lot of inconsistencies between these stories, but this temple marriage thing is driving me crazy. Now we're getting it that he ended up getting married in the, in the temple five years later. So when on earth did they get married in the temple? I'm not sure. But apparently, whenever it was, it was five years after this amazing coincidental encounter, this miraculous encounter that the younger brother had with the older brother that never ended up actually happening. The Hell's Angel ended up being in the state presidency with Kim B. Clark, which is where he learned the story from. Her reaction? How amazing is that? God sure works in mysterious and amazing ways. See, this is the impact the story is supposed to have. This is why it's told. This is why it's a favorite. But I want to draw attention to Kim B. Clark giving the source of his story as the older brother, the repentant brother, the Hell's Angel brother. Because according to this blog, the Hell's Angel ended up being in the stake presidency with Kim B. Clark, which is where he learned the story from. So Kim B. Clark claims direct knowledge from one of the participants in this story. And it is the older brother that he claims direct knowledge from. It is that direct knowledge that Elder Holland's retraction published yesterday, seems desperate to distance itself from. Elder Holland wants to make it clear that he didn't know any of these people. He didn't even talk to their family for crying out loud. Now that clears him from direct knowledge, but it raises the question, as I've mentioned before, so why the heck are you spouting it off to everybody that it's true? And as many people have commented, where is this power of discernment that the apostles are supposed to have? I mean, we know that this power of discernment only works off and on. It's sporadic. It wasn't working when a guy named Mark Hoffman was showing a forged document called the Antone Transcript to the members of the First Presidency, and there's a picture of it that survives today where he's pointing it out to President Kimball, President N. Eldon Tanner, President Marion G. Romney, and Boyd K. Packer's looking on, and so is Gordon B. Hinckley. We know that the spirit of discernment wasn't working for any of those gentlemen right at that moment. So we understand that it's only sporadic, it's off and on, it's hit and miss. And apparently, this spirit of discernment was not working for Elder Holland when he heard this story, believed it was so true that he's going to tell it far and wide, only to find out later it wasn't true. But the point that I was trying to make is that Elder Holland is trying to distance himself from knowing any members of this family. He states again, a few weeks ago when speaking to new mission presidents at the Missionary Training Center, I shared a story about two brothers, just as I heard it from individuals who knew the family and had heard it recounted by a family member. See, this is starting to sound more and more like Elder Kim Clark, who did tell the story in 2015 before Elder Holland liked it so much, apparently, that he appropriated it for his own and started telling it in 2016 and 2017. He says he heard it from individuals, unnamed individuals, who knew the family and had heard it recounted by a family member. So that sounds like Elder Clark saying that he heard it directly from the older brother. Within a few days, my office was contacted by the family who expressed concern that some elements of that account were not accurate due to embellishing by a family member. Well, if what Elder Clark says is true, and if he actually did hear it from the older brother who was a member in the state presidency with him in Idaho, then it must have been the elder brother who was the one who was adding the embellishments. This line of reasoning depends upon, number one, the truthfulness of Elder Clark, second off, the accuracy of the missionary who wrote down the account, and the truthfulness of Elder Holland. But if all those three things are accurate and or truthful, then it was most likely the older brother who told the story to Elder Clark when they served in the state presidency together, and it was certainly the older brother who did the embellishing when he told the story to Elder Clark, because it was Elder Clark who said he heard it from 
the older brother. But wait a second, it gets more convoluted. Because when you go to the church webpage where it gives brief bios of their general authorities and you look up Elder Kim B. Clark, what we find out is that he has apparently never served in a state presidency. Going to the relevant portion of the article, it states Elder Clark has served in a number of church callings, including full-time missionary in the South German Mission, Elder Quorum President, Ward Executive Secretary, Counselor in a Bishopric, Bishop, High Counselor, and Counselor in a Stake. Mission Presidency. Now, it's possible that the sister missionary who wrote that down confused stake mission presidency with stake presidency. That kind of mistake would be common and understandable. But the fact remains that Elder Clark has never served in a stake presidency, according to his official bio on the church website. Circles within circles, curiouser and curiouser. Another comment that has been brought up in relation to this story and the recent retraction is that Elder Holland tacitly admits that he never got permission from the family to tell this story in the first place. He could not have gotten permission from the family because he never talked to any member of the family according to his retraction. Instead, he says he talked to individuals who heard it from members of the family. Which raises the additional question, why is it that when general authorities talk, their spiritual experiences are too sacred to relate, but they certainly seem quite free and easy about sharing the sacred experiences of other people, sacred experiences that they don't bother fact-checking, sacred experiences that, in this case, end up being completely false. And in a broader sense, this story shows how quickly a commonplace type of event, such as a boy leaving his family, leaving the church, going astray for a number of years and ultimately coming back, can be imbued with miraculous elements to the point that it becomes a faith-promoting rumor. It becomes so powerful that it is adopted by a member of the Seventy and then liked so much by a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles that Elder Holland takes it over and begins telling the story repeatedly on his own. What Elder Holland's retraction does is show us how easy it is for mundane stories to become miracle stories. It doesn't take years, it doesn't take decades, it doesn't take hundreds of years, and it doesn't take thousands of years. It can happen in a very brief period of time. All it takes is somebody who wants a story to be miraculous and wants it enough to imbue it with miraculous elements in order to build faith in other people. The point of the story isn't that it is true. The point of the story is that it builds faith. And if it builds faith in the true church, then the story itself must be true, or at least the veracity of the story is only of secondary importance. And what this exposes is the fragility of all miracle stories, not only in Mormonism, not only in Christianity, but really in any religion or any area where a miraculous story is told. Are there miracle stories in early Mormonism? Of course there are. What Elder Holland has just done is shown us how easily those stories could have had the miraculous elements added after the fact, that the stories of early Mormonism could have been very mundane, but they became miraculous later on. We've already talked about examples of that in earlier Radio Free Mormon podcasts, The Transfiguration of Brigham Young, The Voice of God, on December 5th, 1847, at Winter's Quarters, commanding Brigham Young to become the new president. All these things were not recorded by anybody contemporaneously. They only start showing up years after the fact by people who claim that they were there and that this happened. So, very mundane and ordinary stories can become miracle stories if later on people decide that they need a miracle story, that they want a miracle story, that a miracle story will suit the purpose of whatever it is that they are trying to accomplish. So with this retraction, Elder Holland has thrown a huge monkey wrench into all the miracle stories of Mormonism. Are there miracle stories in the New Testament? Of course there are. Elder Holland's retraction has thrown a huge monkey wrench into those stories as well. Because just as easily as this story, the miracle stories of the New Testament, up to and including the resurrection of Jesus Christ, I'm sorry to say it, but it really needs to be said, 
That's the biggest miracle story in the New Testament. It's the biggest miracle story in Christianity. And yet Elder Holland has shown us how easily that could have been fabricated after the fact. We talk about the different gospel authors who each wrote about the resurrection story, that there are four independent witnesses to the resurrection story. Well, that has its own problems if looked at through the lens of New Testament scholarship. But for our purposes, it is sufficient to note that this story, the story about the two brothers, the older and the younger, this amazing, miraculous missionary story, which never happened, already has two witnesses. It had a witness from Elder Clark and a witness from Elder Holland. And if we throw the missionaries into the mix, all of whom wrote about this story, we have at least a half a dozen witnesses to this miraculous story that never actually occurred. So it's not easy to start piling up witnesses for stories that never happened. So the fact that there are different witnesses claimed by the New Testament of these miracles of Jesus up to and including his resurrection don't really amount to a lot when it comes right down to it. In other words, the fact that there are different witnesses does not in and of itself prove that the story actually happened. Are there miracle stories in the Old Testament? Yes, there are. And this same retraction strikes at the foundation of the accuracy and authenticity of each and every one of those miracle stories as well. In the Radio Free Mormon episode dealing with Elder Holland's story about wrong roads, we showed that his recounting of that story completely undercut the epistemology of the entire Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which says, pray to God if you want to know it's true, and he'll tell you that it's true. But Elder Holland's story in Wrong Road said, God told them to go down the wrong road so that when they got to the end of the wrong road, they would know that they were actually supposed to go down the road that God told them not to go down. That story undercut every single spiritual experience in Mormonism, in the New Testament, in the Old Testament, in the Doctrine and Covenants. Every single story was undercut by the wrong road story of Elder Holland. In a similar way now, Elder Holland is outdoing himself. This retraction by Elder Holland is striking at the foundation of every miracle story in Mormonism, in the New Testament, in the Old Testament, in Christianity, basically in every religion in the world. When we find out that this miracle story was not true, did not happen, was not miraculous, how can we have any confidence that any miracle story told by Elder Holland, any of the other apostles, any other church leader since Joseph Smith, or anybody in the Old Testament or New Testament is true. That's the power that this retraction by Elder Holland has to demolish our faith in the miracle stories of Mormonism and the scriptures. Now, I don't want this to sound like another slam on Elder Holland. It is possible, it is possible that everything happened exactly the way Elder Holland said. That he told this story rashly, he didn't check it out, maybe he took Elder Kim B. Clark's word for its authenticity, then he started finding out, hey, it's not authentic, he's trying to do the right thing, he's backing away from it, he's issuing a retraction, he's doing this all in good faith. Maybe that's the case. All I can say is that based upon my analysis, while that's a possibility, it is a possibility that is becoming more and more remote. As most of you know, Elder Holland has gone on record as saying that he went to a pretty good school, he's read a few books, and he is certainly not a dodo. Well, in the immortal words of Meatloaf, two out of three ain't bad. This is Radio Free Mormon, signing off the air. Thank you.